feel uh, to to talk about. But I think I'll give the floor to you first, Lucy, and 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 let's hear your your thoughts and reflections on on, on Brexit and and where are we two years after the the actual exit? Uh, welcome, Lucy. Good to see you. And please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Hi, Morton. It's lovely to be here. It's really good to see you again after a, a very long gap. It was, um, it was, as you say, it felt really tragic and awful to be leaving the European Parliament two years ago. Um, just a terrible um, time for the, for many, many millions of um, pro EU um, UK citizens, and and actually um, many millions of. Um, people from the European Union who live in this country and for whom their rights were um, really uh, in a very uncertain place um, at that time. Uh, th the subsequent two years have been uh, also extraordinary given the pandemic and one of the odd things about talking about the consequences of Brexit is that because it was so linked with the timing of the pandemic, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to disentangle what are pandemic consequences and what are Brexit consequences. Um, I think uh, as the impact of the pandemic sort of um, reduces a little, some of that will become clearer uh, and the different pathways of, of the UK and, um, and our European neighbours will also become clearer but it but it is it has muddled the what are the outcomes of Brexit question <laughs> very mm. considerably uh, yeah. because so much just shut down kind of in the months um, immediately after Brexit because of the pandemic and not because of Brexit so it's it's very complex uh, but there are certainly some very significant con consequences for this country um, and uh, it the, the economic consequences are becoming clearer I think as time goes on. Uh, happy to keep talking, but thank you, Lucy. And 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 we'll try to get a bit round in in all the various topics, but we can easily start out with with economic issues. And perhaps Ian, you you would uh, be so kind as to jump in here as well. I know you've done some extensive work on on, yeah. on this. So yeah. Please, Ian, you have the floor. Great having Super. you here in this panel. Thank you, Morton. In fact, I think the last time we met was when I gave evidence to the European Committee in the mm. Danish Volker team back in October 2016, and I wrote a report for the committee and the parliament on what were the consequences of Brexit, which, you know, was almost impossible to predict because you didn't know what the British government was going to do. Um, and I, I remember writing this quite long report, incredibly compressed with data, which started with uh, politics and then went into economics. Now, as, as I was writing, I, I was kept on thinking, surely not. Sure, no, would anybody do this much harm to themselves, really? You know, having covered quite intensively the, um, the Danish referendums in 92 and 93 and the Danish referendums on the euro and the Swedish euro referendum and the Danish referendum on uh, justice and home affairs. Um, and I, I think one would have to say, uh, at the time, I, I was telling people, well, a lot of steps will have to be taken, very careful steps to, to make the best of a very, very bad deal. But actually, the opposite has happened, is that the worst has been made of what was a very bad deal. Uh, and I think I said this in the report, and I didn't at the time think it would turn out that bad. And people were, uh, and I remember giving the evidence to the, the Danish European Committee, looking around the table, and you, you yourself, I think, would have sat there. And I think most people then, and most people I've spoken to publicly, didn't believe me. Uh, and certainly all, all my friends and family in the UK uh, looked at me as if I was making it up. Um, but the consequences of leaving the EU, and in particular leaving the single market, are economic, but they are social and they're political, and they're coming home to roost, and will come home to roost, because re Brexit is a process, not an event, yeah. for the rest of our and our, my children's working life. Um, so economic but Ian, is, you, that, you, is that because it is a sort of a, a gradual loss, yeah. so to speak, rather yeah. than than a, a single yeah, economic no, right. shock? Yeah. Or, 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 uh, there or has like, been yeah. a huge yeah. shock, though. I mean, just just to, I was talking about the impact of the pandemic and and the combination of the pandemic and Brexit has been yeah. the most enormous shock to the UK Absolutely. economy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I wrote down a couple of things um, earlier on about what that, sh the, the, the kind of impact of that shock. One of those impacts is the impact on inflation and rising prices, which yeah. is having a huge um, political consequences. But the other one, which I think is probably less talked about, but more of a long-term major consequence 
is the impact on um, staff shortages and labour shortages in the UK, yeah. which is not something that we've had in my lifetime at all, partly as a consequence of being a, a part of the European Union. And, and it's, um, it's one of the great ironies that um, one of the key reasons people gave for leaving was immigration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually the, 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 the stopping of freedom of movement is one of the things that's going to have the biggest consequences for the UK economy um, looking forward. And that's, I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise, but it, I think it really is going to be a really long lasting problem for this country that, that actually we have really major skills shortages here, huge problems um, in, in health and social care is the one right. that I'm the most closely connected to, but it's it's a massive issue. Yeah, can, can, can I ask you specifically on the on the economy and the economic issues? I mean, one of the 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 the, the, the topics uh, I believe to be most widely covered, at least in a Danish context, has been the issue of the city of London on, on, on financial services. And 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 what is state of play here in in, in terms of uh, of of say the impacts or, or ramifications of Brexit here? Uh, what's going on now in in the city? Yeah, if I can start. Um, it's largely misunderstood the way that the UK economy has been rebalanced since the 1980s, but it is overwhelmingly a service economy. 80% um, of gross domestic product, approximately 45 to 50% of exports, and approximately 85% of employment are in the service sectors. Now, many of these are not exportable. Um, people always focus entirely on the, the financial service industry, and that's that's not unimportant, but it's not the major service industry. Right. Uh, other business services is the primary service industry of the UK. And those can only be with uh, businesses that agree to joint rules and regulations and governance. Uh, you know, Lucy could tell you more about this, having worked on this committee in the European Parliament. But people have just totally missed this. And, and this will play out over a very, very long time. And it's far more painful than the loss of export markets for manufacturing products. Or, or unfortunately, even the loss of skilled labour and labour shortages, which the UK is currently experiencing. Yes, financial industries, in a way, is what we focus on. Um, it will ultimately lead to uh, the significant decrease in the impact and importance of the, the City of London and the financial centre. In some respects, it already has, with the loss of majority trading patterns in shares to Amsterdam. Um, but it, it's, the, it's other services that we have to look out for. Um, the big winner in this, interestingly, at least in the, the short term, has been Ireland, who managed to pick up some of the uh, service industries, financial service industries, and other business service industries. In fact, during the pandemic, although most services decreased, actually service trade uh, with Ireland and Ireland to the rest of the EU increased. So uh, Ireland has become the big winner from this game. And that's the nature of services. It's a person to person, business to business practice. And you have to be able to speak the language. If you think uh, that the UK economy can somehow miraculously break out of its relationship on services and on financial services um, and start trading with other economies around the world, particularly those in different time zones, there's a nasty shock coming. What saved the city of London so far is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's prevented skilled financial advisors, uh, legal advisors, uh, management consultants, business consultants from leaving uh, and relocating as the, uh, the European Central Bank and the Commission and the Parliament would like them to do so within the relative safety and security and oversight of the single market on internal services. Mm -hmm. um, so we are in for a big surprise in that respect. Um, of course, technology has changed and is increasingly changing the, the, the patterns of financial services. Um, so some of these shifts would have occurred anyway, but um, with potential risk of decreasing oversight and decreasing concern in the city of London for the euro and the eurozone, uh, we would expect this to uh, increase. But I'm sure Lucy has a view on this as well. I, th I think one of the things <laughs> one of the things I'd like to um, to flag up. I mean, I don't disagree with anything that Ian said. I think it is a it's a long term, um, slow departure of of, an, of of a huge amount of service um, industries. Uh, it's really interesting how many relatively small companies in this country have simply stopped. Um, trading yeah. with Europe, they, they've just stopped doing that bit of activity, which in 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 terms of our economy, is going to be quite a significant um, 
quite significantly damaging uh, because it's just preventing some of our small companies from growing because they can't expand into those um, other neighboring markets. And, and if you're a small company and you're finding it too difficult to trade with France or Ireland because of the red tape involved, you're not gonna suddenly start trading with India. So, yeah. um, so that whole idea that we're, we're leaving the EU in order to gain a, a huge market share for those small companies, that's not just, that's just not gonna happen. But the other thing that I think is really important and is sometimes overlooked in this debate is that um, the impact on the, the UK treasury of all of that activity is significantly greater than many most U UK citizens would notice. Okay. So, so they don't necessarily. I mean, they notice a little bit if if um, so and so up the road has has up up sticks and moved to Amsterdam or Dublin, but or, or if um, Mrs. Bloggs has has stopped selling her um, little her text for her textiles to France. She only concentrates on the UK these days and doesn't grow her business. And a couple of people are out of work. People notice that a little bit. What? But but the impact of that sort of small change on a personal level on the UK Treasury is very significant. And right. given the difficulties this country has in terms of its um, tax system and uh, and huge costs that we've incurred um, as a result of the pandemic. I think I can totally understand why Rishi Sunak is extremely nervous uh, about how he's going to balance the books looking forward. So, and I, and that's a real, I mean, the, 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 um, the revenue that the UK Treasury gets from those financial services is, is huge and it would only take a relatively small gradual decline in that to have quite a significant impact. But, but Lucy, if I can pick up on this, um, uh, and, and, and bear in mind, I, I come from a country that has numerous opt-outs vis-a-vis the European Union, and, and, and we have, like, the French would somehow admire the Danes saying that you have, a, like, an a la carte approach to, I mean, you, you pick and choose whatever you, you feel like uh, uh, joining or participating in, and then you, you leave the rest, and, and by the way, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, our opt-outs are, are, are contested in so many ways and are, are, are becoming, in my opinion, an increasingly uh, big burden on us, but, but that, that's a different issue. But I, I, I want to get back to this point on economics and to which extent economics actually affects, say, the, the voting behavior, because if in, 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 you know, in, a, in a realistic perception, I think we would all agree that yes you 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 incur a loss on yourself by leaving the eu but isn't the point that that a majority of of brits then said yes well there might be a loss but we are willing to pay this uh, this loss because we seem to gain sovereignty in a political way or or what how how, how has this so, been played so out i think, think this is i think this is really interesting um i think that people in a in a very um kind of there there are some people in this country and i have to say i think they're a significant minority who would say oh yes i'm willing to forego some of my income in order to get back sovereignty However, it's all very well to actually say that, but now that taxes are going up and inflation is going up, it'll be interesting to see how many people are really prepared and happy to pay the price that, that is a smaller economy. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's the question that we've got coming at us down the track quite quickly. All of that um, sort of potential consequences of Brexit, again, have been completely put on hold by the pandemic because the government just spent vast amounts of money during the pandemic in order to try and keep the, the economy going while everything was shut down um, and has racked up enormous debts. And, and it's not terribly, I mean, many governments across the world have done, have racked up debts as a result of the pandemic. At some point, they're gonna have to be, start re being repaid and, and the budget is gonna have to start being balanced. And we're only just starting that conversation in this country. Um, and, and I think that the, um, the impact of uh, falling living standards, which is what we're actually facing. I mean, when, when people say, oh, yes, I'd be prepared to pay a little bit in order to have my sovereignty back. Um, I think they tend to think, uh, oh, I, I, uh, my, my, I'll, I'll just not have quite as much foreign holiday or I'll have a, mm. one or two bottles of wine less when what they actually find is that petrol prices have gone up by 20 percent 
um, which is where we are at the moment. Right. Um, that's that's perhaps slightly different. The other thing that um, is is deeply frustrating in this country at the moment is that actually many of that. So we've just had a tax. We've got a big, a significant tax rise um, forecast for April. Um, it's falling on working age population mm -hmm. and the working age population did not vote for Brexit. So right. it's going to be very interesting to see what the political consequences of that are, because actually the people who are paying for the, the increased costs are not the people who voted for Brexit. And you can see why that might be um, very much in Boris Johnson's interest. But, but there is there has to be a question about how long he can get away with that for. Mm -hmm. Ian, please, uh, what will be your yeah. reflections on, on, on this topic? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. The, the, the pandemic has made it possible for Boris Johnson uh, and his government to disguise things and pass them off as the result of the pandemic, when they are manifestly not true. Uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility, responsible for statistical oversight of the British economy, um, has predicted and, and does so freely that it will cost about £30 billion a year um, because of the Brexit. And so Rizek uh, Sudak, the, the, the Chancellor, has now building this into gradual tax rises, particularly income tax, but also national insurance tax rises, up until 2025 uh, to cover about 25 billion a year. And bear in mind, you know, how much were you willing to pay to get your sovereignty back? That's about eight times the annual fee. But in real terms, that's absolutely nothing compared to a, a two trillion economy. So the, the, the actual economic damage is beneath the surface and will take a much longer as business unties unravel to materialize. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know about Lucy, but I had the joy of experiencing the 1970s as a school child and the 1980s as a new entrant into the British economy. Now in the early 1980s, something not so dissimilar occurred, but, but for very different reasons where entire industri industrial sectors were destroyed and ceased to exist. So I left the country as anyone would. And the tragedy now, of course, is increasingly hard for younger people who cannot enter the workplace to leave the country. In fact, they're trapped because the rules aren't the same now as they were when I left. And then that's increasingly, increasingly possible anymore. In Australia, the, all these doorways are shut. So, it, you know, this is a very, very difficult socio-economic situation that will play out, and it will play out so badly. Everything that's going on in the House of Commons today is about actually perpetuating and increasing distrust between the government, members of parliament, unfortunately, and ordinary people. And the more they realise as they watch the lines of trucks or the lines to find food or the lines to get a job in the UK, that they have been sold alive, the, the incredible, incredible divisions and distinctions of which we have not seen the like of since the Thatcher era will reassert themselves. I'm absolutely certain on this um, in the UK. Can I just say that, that yes, one, please, one area it? where I'm I'm not sure, I think things, so there's, a, there's a huge amount that I agree with um, from mm. Ian, but, but one of the things that I think may be slightly different is the labour market, in yeah. that actually the, the issue that we have in this country at the moment is not that there aren't enough jobs, it's that there aren't enough people to fill the jobs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and that um, has its own quite significant consequences. So, so at the moment, I mean, I'm... Um, I run the county council in Cambridgeshire, um, which is the, the organization responsible for um, social care. Uh, we have huge problems in trying to recruit enough people um, to look after older people, um, people with learning disabilities. Uh, we are not, I mean, you can't just not do that work. We can't just yeah. decide, well, actually we won't look after people with learning disabilities. That's not possible. So we're gonna have to increase wages very significantly in order to find the people that we need to do it. That's going to have very significant costs and that those costs fall on the taxpayer. Uh, the danger of a, um, a huge wage, a huge wage pressure in this country leading to increased inflation, um, which again leaves big costs on government um, is is massive, and uh, so, so it is a slightly different situation yeah. from yeah. from the one in the 1980s when actually yeah. there were a lot of people out of work. At the moment, our issue is that we don't have enough people to do the jobs, and if we yeah. we can probably find them, but it's going to be expensive. Yeah, yeah, no, I, we don't disagree, Lucy. Um, 
you know, the, the, the effects in the 1980s were structural. Um, yeah. and, and I think this is structural as well. Yeah, um, I think I just think it's good that the, the, the immediate impacts are going to be slightly different. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. But sure. but the yeah. but the the danger of a deeply unbalanced economy with huge costs, particularly. I mean, we've got a really seriously aging population in this country, uh, which is a which is an issue yeah. that's facing yeah. that's many right. many countries across the world. Yeah, that's uh, right. But but actually, um, it's going to be a big problem here if we can't find the people if if we don't have yeah. um, staff to help. And and, and uh, picking up on on, on uh, you, you say unbalanced. Uh, economy but 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 um, I guess the same sort of notion of unbalanced or imbalances or, or what have you uh, applies to I'd say the general perspectives uh, we, we discussed be before getting live uh, we were, were talking about this split between urban centers and and the countryside split between young and old in terms of, of their approaches and, and voting behaviors vis-a-vis uh, -vis Brexit or perceptions of, of this. Could you, Lucy, could you could you elaborate a little on, on, on this, on, on, on what are you seeing in terms of, I think, fragmentation or, or, or polarization or, or whatever word you, you, you would describe this with, uh, but, but this is what it seems like seen from a distance, but, but please, Lucy. So, so it's really interesting. Um, there was this enormous polarization in the British electorate um, as a result of the um, Brexit referendum. And, and the country divided very strongly into Remainers and Leavers. Um, that, that was the defining um, political question for the last four years, really. Uh, but no, um, up until we left, um, but then again, it's been completely overtaken by the pandemic. Yeah, right. uh, so, so we we went into the pandemic an incredibly divided country. Um, uh, the the pandemic, to a certain extent, brought everyone together again because yeah. actually people refocused on their local community. They refocused on. Um, making friends with their neighbours, if that makes sense. There was a huge sense of you have to look after the people in your street. We all have to work together and pull together. That actually, I think, um, meant that there was a sense in which we people stood by the government. I mean, I, as somebody who has always loathed Boris Johnson, I found it utterly extraordinary that the, um, the way in which people were willing to give the Conservatives the benefit of the doubt over the two years of the pandemic. It really it was bizarre. Um, but I think that that sense of people pulling together is rapidly fragmenting again. And the, and the, um, the, <laughs> the current debate in Parliament over Partygate, which is becoming more and more extraordinary and has been over the last couple of months, um, I think is, is it, to some extent, politics in the UK returning to something more like normal, not pandemic politics. Mm. Um, and it will be very, very interesting to see how much people continue to be willing to give the Conservatives the benefit of the doubt. And, I, and I'm not sure that uh, I, we were discussing before we came on the response of the country to um, what is currently going on with our government, which is deeply embarrassing. Um, and, and I think that there is a real sense of anger now um, at Boris Johnson in particular. Um, and it will be fascinating to see whether that actually leads to a much less um, generous analysis by the British public of the consequences of Brexit, because, because um, he is being demonstrated to be a liar. Um, and, and I think that once that is something that people are beginning to look at with a different set of eyes, it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I, I, the, the polling, so the, the Remain Leave question is still a very significant division within UK politics, um, but it's no longer the thing that is at the top of people's minds. I think that, that actually other issues such as the cost of living um, are things that people are actually more worried about. Um, for most people, I don't think that they see that cost of living issue as a Brexit issue. People like me, who've been <laughs> passionate for Remainers for years, see it mm. as a Brexit issue. But I think that the, the UK public as a, as a whole doesn't at the moment think that the cost of living crisis that we're facing is just about Brexit. 
Um, I think they think it's a range of different things. And I think that the, the um, arguments that have been in the press um, about the fact that, that um, oil prices and gas prices are high across the world is, kind of, again, disguising it. But I'm not sure how long that's going to continue to be um, something that people can get away with, if that makes sense. Um, and, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter too much what people blame it on, as long as they blame it on the government. <laughs> Ian, would, would you care to comment on, on, on the issue of, of uh, fragmentation and polarization? I don't, did we lose uh, Ian? Are you with us? Or, or... Wait, I'm worried we've lost him. Uh, did we lose him? <laughs> I, well, oh, he comes we, back. We'll I'm sure he'll rejoin us. We'll <laughs> <be fine. laughs> we were talking a little bit about the, um, the, the, the other divisions in politics, which, which kind of overlap with the Brexit, Remain, Leave divisions, which were to do with urban rural divides yes. um, and also um, age divides, differences between the way yeah. in which older people and younger people vote. And, and it was really clear that... Um, the 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 pattern of um, remain voters also being younger voters and right. more likely to be urban was right. is and and that continues those those all of those things overlap hugely mm -hmm. so ian, ian you're with us again <laughs> i am back um, yes yeah. so, so <laughs> Uh, you, you left us where Lucy was saying a lot of good stuff and you came back when she was saying even more good stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, excellent. But, now, but, excellent. but now I'll give you a chance to elaborate a little or, or a comment on, on this uh, yeah. say, uh, fragmentation issue or uh, polarization yeah. issue and, and, and your thoughts on this. Please. Yeah, I, I mean, I always make the argument it's impossible to separate the economic from the social and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's most of what Lucy was saying. Um, the, I... Oh, no, we're going to lose them again. I um, voted in Canterbury, which is a uh, Canterbury is a, um, a, a, a an urban setting, a little bit like uh, Cambridge in the, in the heartland of um, Brexit voting, um, rural East Kent, and so you, you kind of felt on the front line of debates and discussions. Um, I don't think anyone in East Kent thought they were about to become a lorry park for the rest of their lives. Um, <laughs> but it's not just that distinction: the rural, uh, urban. That one of the things that's but again, I think if we reflect just a little bit back on the 80s, and I, I know it's different in terms of economic impact, is the birth of Plaid Cymru and the Scottish National Party have their origins as political forces in the 1980s. Um, and certainly the situation in Northern Ireland worsened considerably. Now, Northern Ireland, of course, is a different setting. It has um, coped the best with the pandemic economically, um, or, although that's not very good overall in terms of economic terms. But the, the type of ignition, I grew up in, in uh, Portishead in, near Bristol, in, uh, across the, the channel from Wales, um, and it's, it's quite clear that Welsh nationalism and Scottish nationalism are ignited by the distance and the political and economic and social distance from, from Westminster and from the English Conservative Party. So we have to think also about a potential nationalities crisis. Again, it's a long, slow burning crisis. Um, but if you add it to the pandemic and the perception that, that London and in England didn't handle this as well as uh, Wales and Scotland, this is a, a very interesting distinction, to put it mildly. Um, and, and then there's also the fact that, that Brexit economically seems to be panning out in different ways, rurally and regionally. Uh, so exactly those, those uh, parts of the UK that voted to leave appear to be those that are being hit hardest yes. with a combination of inflation and, and manufacturing and export losses. And I don't need to mention fishing, you know, and agriculture. Um, but I think we have to because these were two of the industries that um, the people that told stories for Boat Leave said would be extinguished by Brexit. Um, they were very quiet about it, but they were at least being honest. Uh, it's very difficult to see these industries sustained. It, it, in the, the medium to long term. So it's an absolute tragedy in terms of the cross-cutting factors between rural and urban, between, as Lucy has said, educated um, and relatively mm. undereducated. Mm. But now it becomes increasingly a nationalities process. And, and, and could we elaborate a little on this, please, uh, Nana? I'd be curious to have your, your thoughts on this, because could you uh, explain to us, uh, Danes, I mean, the sensitivities uh, I mean, it, it came as a big surprise for me, at least personally, that the 
Northern Ireland issue and question was yeah. that sensitive. Uh, I, I, and, and this is my yeah. ignorance. Uh, and, but, but, uh, but, but I, think, these, I, think, uh, I think for a lot of Danes, this was a big surprise that 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 the peace agreement, the settlement, was so fragile or sensitive, uh, given uh, what's happened. So, so please, could you say a few words on Northern Ireland and, and Wales or Scotland, for that matter, please? So it's absolutely extraordinary that the British government um, um, didn't realise just how sensitive the Northern Ireland border was going to be. I mean, the Northern Ireland border has been um, incredibly sensitive for centuries, um, and, and the relationship between England, effectively, and Ireland has been incredibly difficult for centuries. Um, it took decades to get peace in Northern Ireland, um, and part of that peace was uh, achievable because the European Union made it possible not to have a border in between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. It made an absolutely enormous difference to the achievability of that peace process. The idea that you would put back um, a hard border between Northern and Southern Ireland would is is um, would would be catastrophic for Northern Ireland. Um, so, I mean, it, it is just extraordinary that the British government were so um, blasé and uh, irresponsible about the way in which they handled that border. And I still am extremely worried about um, the way in which I think Boris Johnson in particular, but also the people around him are willing to threaten peace in Northern Ireland um, for the sake of uh, making the right political headlines in London or, or um, with, with their Brexit voters. Um, and the thing that's really um, very odd is, is just how the, the, um, the inability and, and unwillingness of many of those Brexit voters to recognise the serious threat that there now is to the United Kingdom as a United Kingdom. And I absolutely agree with what Ian said about um, the impact on Scottish nationalism and and to a lesser extent Welsh nationalism but Scottish nationalism in particular yeah. um, has received the most enormous I mean it was doing pretty well already it's received the most enormous boost as a result of both the combination of the of Brexit followed by Nicola Sturgeon doing a very good job in terms of uh, in, in the way in which she's perceived to have managed the pandemic and and Boris Johnson having been perceived in Scotland to have managed it very very badly um, so, I mean, the, um, the, the impact on the relationship between um, Northern Ireland and England and Scotland and England is, is quite different two years on from where it was two years ago. Um, and, and that's something that actually will have really, really long term consequences. And it's I mean, it's actually these days really quite easy to see a picture whereby in 10 years time, um, both Northern Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom and Scotland is also um, an independent country. Um, I think if, if that happens, I, I, would, I would expect nationalism in Wales to also be growing, but I think it will happen more slowly. Um, none of that is inevitable. I mean, a huge amount rides on, depends on what happens in the next general election, which is actually only three and a half years away. Um, is it three and a half? It might even be less than that, actually. No, it must be less, right? <laughs> I think so. It might be two and a half years away. But anyway, um, so um, what happens then will have a, a, a significant impact on right. those relationships because it, because it would be possible for us, it would not be possible for us to return to the European Union rapidly at that point because I don't think you'd have us back that quickly. <laughs> but it would be possible to start some serious conversations about freedom of movement and the single market and, and those kinds of things if there was a will to do that from the British government. If we continue to have a conservative, determinedly um, anti-European government, then I think that the likelihood of Scotland and Northern Ireland departing further from England um, is quite is, is really quite high and it, and it is um i mean the conservative party has effectively become an english party um it's it's um has very small representation right. outside england right ian ian your, your thoughts on northern ireland and, and scotland yeah. and, and wales please i think it's really important to remember um that the the government uh, david cameron's government knew potentially knew this was wrong but chose not to address it, I read 
hazed it with David Livington when he came. Number one major danger to the UK is Northern Ireland. And, and he admitted in, uh, publicly <laughs> in a public debate that he'd not thought about it. Now, given he was former shadow uh, minister for Northern Ireland, um, that, that told you something really, really dreadful about British conservatism and, um, uh, and, and Republicanism. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in 10 years' time, both to the EU and, and if, if the Northern Ireland Protocol is, uh, remains and continues to succeed, other places like Scotland will look at it and say, why can't we have that? Uh, Scottish nationalism just lost out in the last referendum, but the, the polls, mm -hmm. all the polls have reversed this, as Liz has pointed out, um, for a whole variety of reasons, not least the fact that the Scottish economy is slightly different to the UK. Um, uh, you know, we may may dismiss for now Welsh nationalism, but having grown up with S4C, the Welsh language channel, language is at the heart of uh, mm -hmm. Welsh nationalism in a way it's not in Ireland and Scotland, and so we, we cannot dismiss that. Yes, Plaid Cymru, a minority nationalist party, are not that important, but Labour in Wales has now gradually switched to greater claims for independence, moving to a genuine assembly comparable to Scotland which potentially could lead to, with time, greater claims mm -hmm. for a similar mm -hmm. position to either Scotland or Northern Ireland in terms of connectivity to the single market. And that would give it a dramatic economic edge, which has costs and consequences for the UK, uh, the rest of the UK, in particular England. So, you know, uh, but you're right, Lucy, the English Conservative Party, quite frankly, doesn't care. And when I gave this talk uh, just before the referendum in Stockholm and the British ambassador was there at the time, somebody said, surely, people care about Scotland and I said no they don't I'm sorry uh, and the, the British ambassador went incredibly angry, angry and <laughs> he couldn't say anything <laughs> he was in Perdue at the time so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, can, can I can I turn to to an issue that that I know is is, is very much uh, at the close to 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 your heart Lucy the issue of of, of citizens rights and 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 all the all, all the Brits living abroad, and 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 and, and what kind of discussion and debate are, are is there in 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 UK on uh, on this? I mean, I I, I get uh, I'm being approached by by Brits living in 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 Denmark that are preoccupied with this, obviously. But what would be sort of state of play or, or general impressions on on this discussion? Is that is that a, a big issue in in the, in in the debate in in, in England right now? I'm afraid to say it really isn't. I mean, the whole issue of citizens' rights just doesn't appear anywhere in the debate in the UK. It's 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 a non-issue. And one of the tragedies is that actually all of the UK political parties have effectively gone silent on Brexit because they know that the British public um, had had enough of it by the time we left and doesn't want to hear about it anymore. And none of the political parties are really willing to um, to make it a big issue. Um, I, am, I, I know that my own party has, uh, which is the Liberal Democrats, has um, uh, <laughs> a very keen core group who are trying very hard to make sure that it doesn't get dropped off the agenda. Um, and, and we are, I mean, absolutely will continue to fight for the rights of, um, British citizens abroad and EU citizens in the UK and we're very aware that for, that for all of those groups there are major concerns about their rights um, to have family members here or to be able to move and work, um, live and work in different places. Um, but in terms of it being a major political issue, it's just not on the national agenda in any way at all. Um, and, and I think, I mean, it, it's, it's another of so, such a long list of tragedies of Brexit that one of the reasons that the referendum campaign probably went the way it did was because of the exclusion of British citizens abroad from voting. Um, they, they have been effectively shut out of this process from the very beginning. Uh, and that's appalling. Uh, but it's not getting a lot of attention. Ian, your thoughts yeah. on, on, on this topic? <laughs> well, let me let me speak as a British citizen abroad. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the referendum would have been turned if uh, EU citizens who voted in local elections in Britain uh, could have voted, or British citizens who voted in local elections outside yeah. of Britain could have voted. It's as simple right. as that. Um, right. 
we've been, in fact been disenfranchised and so have they and it's an absolute tragedy. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, can, can, can I just, just for my understanding, must, Ian, what, 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 what yeah. was it in terms of disenfranchisement? What, what, what happened? Uh, how, how come this yeah, was sure. not uh, so, feasible so at all? Two disenfranchisements occurred. It became very difficult to become, uh, to get the right to vote in the UK in time for the election. And most people didn't because they didn't understand why they would do that uh, as a long time. Uh, the other way around, there was a cutoff of 15 years um, for UK citizens living outside of the EU and it was hard to do to continue to keep the registration up in the UK to vote uh, I managed to do so um, but it was but I think we have to come back to an economic issue here um, the presence of UK citizens outside of the UK in the EU is central to the success of services uh, and and we only start to realize this when we look at if you ban and or no longer have logistics like truck drivers, just to take a simple example. Um, if you negotiate an agreement where UK truck drivers can, for example, drive to France and back again, it's a bilateral agreement. Everything now to do with UK citizens' rights between the UK and EU member states are bilateral. Now, I'm a Brit who lives in Sweden and worked in Denmark. I had no rights, nothing, mm. just like that, they're gone. And even worse, my employer knew that. <laughs> so uh, if I tried to change job as a Brit living in Sweden, working in Denmark, good luck with that. You know, my mm. employer knew that. Um, so that partially wow. had an effect on transport for commuters because our, all our rights, if they were negotiated, in many cases, they weren't a bilateral. Now take that back to the service industry, whether you're Elton John um, or Dyson, manufacturing or drug sales reps or university lecturers, suddenly you're working bilaterally. You don't have the right to hop over to France, to hop over to Belgium, to hop over to Germany, come back again. Whether that's a truck, a lecture, an intellectual property or a concert tour, it's gone and will probably never come back. If you're an 80, 85 percent service economy, that is disastrous, absolutely yeah. disastrous. So the issue of citizenship and the mobility that comes with citizenship, whether it's the right to live, to have a family, to be educated or to work, is extremely important in the debate about free movement of, moon, of services, of people uh, and business and capital as well. And, and you can't disaggregate them easily. You know, it's not one thing for services, one thing for citizens, one thing for industry and manufacturing. Your car industry relies on sales and services. You know, um, sure. and, and and as you break up the, the supply lines and the integrated service structures uh, and the logistics of manufacturing or Airbus or whatever you want it to be, that naturally occurs because you've broken up the ability of experts from Britain to go to Toulouse to give their opinion on fuselage assembly for Airbus. Right, 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 right. And, and so it's not, it's not a separate question from the question of the economy. These are the same questions. And they can only be returned with membership of the single market. The customs union won't, won't cut it. You know, the border queues to get between Turkey and Bulgaria are the same as the queues to get from Calais to Dover. Um, right, right. You know, and, and customs union won't solve any of this. But this, this, uh, thank you so much, Ian, and, and uh, time is running, but this leads yeah. up to my very final question to you two, a very short and difficult one. Will, will the UK come back into EU? Will you have a new <laughs> referendum ultimately? And will we see you again as full members of the EU? Please, so I think, final I'm reflections, gonna go, Lucy. <laughs> I'm going to go first on this. Um, <laughs> the, the obvious answer is I don't know. I think if we have um, a, a change of government in, in at the next election, um, then the UK may come back as a member of the EU. I mean, clearly not kind of in five years, but maybe in ten or fifteen, because I think that the the demographics and the um, the all support that. Um, if we don't get a change of government in 
at the next general election. I don't think the UK will, because I'm not sure how long the UK will exist for. Um, I, I think that it's highly likely that if we continue to have the same kind of government that we have now, that within the next 10 years, the pressure for no the departure of Northern Ireland and Scotland will be enormous. And and that therefore actually maybe one day England will become a member again, <laughs> creeping back. Um, but that before that, Scotland and Northern Ireland will, will become members again. And I think there'll be an awful lot of um, English people who'll be busy moving north and getting their EU citizenship back and, but via a different route. <laughs> but but I, I hope very much that actually we will go a different route and we will see a change of direction um, within the next kind of, um, at the point of the next general election. And then and then there is a route back. I mean, and that route is via um, the single market. Um, and, and, and once we're back inside the single market, I'm sure there'll be a lengthy discussions about what happens after that, but it becomes much less of a problem once we're back inside the single market because that freedom of movement returns. And, and while the UK as, a, um, as an irritating, uh, partner might continue to be that it will it will economically be back within the um, EU's remit if that makes sense. Oh, thanks Lucy. Ian what do you say? Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll I be mean, back. Initially I didn't think we would be back in my lifetime and, and that's because I thought um, the governments of May and then Johnson would do a better job than they did but it, what's become clear to me over time and I'm sure Lucy feels the same way is there's literally no one competent uh, or able to freely think of what's the best thing for British people. Because this setup we have now is not the best thing for ordinary British people. It's literally killing them. Uh, and the, the inflation and the higher tax rates and the lack of public services and the lack of skilled workers, whether it's in the service sector, the care sector, the hospitality sector, the logistics sector, will continue as long as this goes on. It will never, there's no going back to normal. There's no golden world out there. And so from 2020 onwards, it's quite clear to me, this is the worst Brexit imaginable. And it's a failure, it's an utter failure. There is no one out there telling us what's good. Boris Johnson will attempt to present some of the positives of Brexit and none of them will do anything to solve the challenges that he now faces. So just as Lucy has touched upon, I think there is a slow and painful route back to the EU for perhaps the UK, but more likely England and the other countries uh, of the United Kingdom in their different ways to negotiate different relations, whether that's full membership, whether it's membership of the single market, the customs union, EEA membership, or some bizarre Switzerland-like arrangement, which mm. the commission doesn't think works, and I, and I don't think the parliament thinks work well either, because mm. every time you change a piece of domestic legislation, you have, we have to renegotiate a whole series yeah. of bilateral relations. So it literally sure. doesn't work. Um, sure. But I now think it's inevitable. I think it's inevitable, and demographics have already changed that. There hasn't been support in the UK across public opinion for Lee mm. since July 2016, uh, 17, excuse me. No systematic support for the current position of this government and in the end that will crush the conservatives of the right um, uh, and I hope someday um, bring back parties such as Lib Dem and um, the Labour Party to where they need to be uh, in order to turn this around for the sake quite frankly of my family and my nieces and nephews and all the younger people who want what they've lost. My children who are furious. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, Lucy, thank you so much for sharing all your insights and, uh, and reflections and thoughts and perspectives on this uh, extremely important uh, topic. And uh, thank you for being with us and sharing all this. And uh, we appreciate it so much. So let's stay in touch and, and we hope all the best. And, uh, thank, and, you and, and thank you again for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's been for a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.